Um, I'm just really delighted to share a little bit about my postdoc research with you all today. Um, specifically with uh, developing patient-specific in vitro models of aortic valve disease. So in our hearts, we all have four heart valves that regulate blood flow through the heart. My focus is on the aortic valve, which is positioned here between the left ventricle and the aorta and controls blood flow from the heart to the rest of our bodies. And unfortunately, aortic valve disease, uh, aortic valves become diseased with age, among other risk factors, such as sex, if you are a man, you have a twofold higher risk of developing aortic valve stenosis. Um, your race can impact uh, disease management. Uh, so we also know that uh, you're 54% less likely to receive treatments for aortic valve disease if you are black. <clears throat> uh, there's also issues with hypertension. If you have high hypertension, you are at risk for the disease, in addition to high fat diets. Um, overall, aortic valve stenosis impacts 13% of patients aged over 75 years old. And unfortunately, aortic valves, uh, they become increasingly stiff. So essentially, these aortic valve leaflets become stiffer over time and develop fibrosis and eventual calcification, which can cause symptoms of angina, syncope, and heart failure, and can lead to very short survival times after diagnosis without treatment. Um, aortic valve disease is not only a disease of the aortic valve, it's also a disease of the heart. Due to the increased workload on blood, uh, on, on the heart tissue, the left ventricle can develop severe cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis. The only current treatment available includes surgical replacements of the valve. Now, surgical replacements can be quite beneficial for patients, but don't come without their limitations, such as the fact that uh, patients might develop restenosis or may not even be a candidate for the surgical procedure at all. So there's really this essential clinical need to develop non-surgical treatments, uh, potentially using small molecule drugs to slow or halt disease progression. And the least invasive procedure available is known as the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. <clears throat> so here a replacement valve is collapsed onto a balloon catheter and the balloon is inflated to deploy this new heart valve. And TAVR has been shown to improve uh, survival for severe AVS patients relative to full valve uh, replacement surgeries where you have to crack open the chest and replace the heart valve. Um, TAVR has also been shown to provide system-wide benefits for aortic valve stenosis patients. So a recent study shows that TAVR is able to improve remodeling of this fibrotic cardiac tissues with significant reductions in septum width, left ventricular mass, and left and, and diastolic volume as shown in these cardiac MRI images. And interestingly, both male and female patients exhibit reverse remodeling after TAVR, with male patients showing more improved remodeling relative to female patients. So the underlying biology of how fibrosis is reduced in cardiac and valve and cardiac tissues after TAVR. Uh, remains, uh, remains unknown. And as it turns out, cardiac remodeling after TAVR can predict survival outcomes. So in this example, uh, the left ventricular mass index is greater in patients that die one year after TAVR relative to patients that survive the TAVR procedure and show significant cardiac remodeling. So as such, there's this really in, uh, great interest in the cardiology community to try to understand the biological mechanisms behind this remodeling process and ultimately determine more clearly how a patient might respond to a valve replacement procedure. So that brings me to the clinical problem for this study. Our biological understanding of how patients respond to TAVR is limited and may inform overall recovery, risk of complications, and overall patient outcomes. So, to understand this underlying biology, we can turn to uh, fibroblasts. So in general, tissue-specific fibroblasts, such as valvular interstitial cells in the valve leaflet, can activate to what's known as a myofibroblast. And these myofibroblasts, uh, when chronically activated, can cause aberrant accumulation of extracellular matrix proteins and cause overall stiffening of aortic valve tissue. And this occurs in other types of tissues during fibrotic disease. And multiple microenvironmental cues can govern fibroblast activation in tissues, uh, such as matricellular signaling, extracellular matrix composition, and matrix modulus. 
in addition to a variety of biochemical cues coming from the inflammation response. So the inflammatory response is intimately involved in myofibroblast activation processes. Uh, and specifically, factors that are secreted in patient sera. So uh, these factors, um, such as uh, TGF-beta, are known to drive myofibroblast activation in a variety of different tissues and cause ultimately and ultimately cause fibrosis. So the research question for this study is trying to understand how the biochemical factors might change in response to a TAVR procedure and potentially this alteration in serum, serum factor composition might lead to improved tissue remodeling in the cardiac tissues. So that brings me to the hypothesis for this study. So we sought to design in vitro models of cardiac uh, disease to understand the biology of how patients might respond to a TAVR procedure. So we hypothesized that serum from pre-TAVR patients may contain factors that drive myofibroblast activation in valve and cardiac tissues. But after a TAVR procedure, and the, we hypothesized that the uh, serum factor composition might change to lead to a cellular phenotype that where these serum factors might maintain fibroblast quiescence or even deactivate the myofibroblast phenotype in valve and cardiac tissues after TAVR. So to start to probe this hypothesis, uh, I closely worked with uh, Professor Tim McKinsey and Dr. Kate Schwetzi, a cardiologist at CU Anschutz Medical School. And she had been, uh, we've been working closely to collect serum samples uh, from TAVR patients immediately after, uh, before their TAVR procedure, immediately before their TAVR procedure, and one month after their TAVR procedure. And we analyzed our samples with a somologic DNA actomer array. It's essentially a proteomic array where we can analyze 1,300 different proteins in our serum samples. Uh, we can essentially attach these serum proteins to DNA aptomers and release these aptomers uh, and perform a microarray to correlate for fluorescence units with protein abundance in the sample. So it's essentially a really nice uh, strategy to uh, study the proteome of these serum samples. And we found by using the somologic array that the, there is an in, indeed an altered serum proteome after TAVR. We observe 156 proteins to be more abundant in pre-TAVR sera relative to post-TAVR sera, and 127 proteins to be more abundant in post-TAVR sera relative to pre. And after performing an ontological characterization, so we essentially categorize these proteins as extracellular proteins, as immune-associated proteins, and as cytokines, we could begin to narrow down the candidate factors that might lead to myofibroblast activation in pre-TAVR sera and myofibroblast deactivation in post-TAVR sera. And we next tested VIC response to these human serum cues. So our strategy here was to obtain valvular interstitial cells from porcine aortic valves, and then we cultured these cells on tissue culture plastic, and then we treated the cells with either sera from pre-TAVR patients and sera from post-TAVR sera from the same patient. And we hypothesized that these cells would activate to myofibroblasts in the presence of pre-TAVR serum cues, and deactivate or maintain their fibroblast quiescence in the presence of post-TAVR serum cues. But sometimes as science goes, our data did not match our hypothesis. So let me walk you through this uh, data set here. So on the y-axis, we have percent activation, which is essentially the number of cells that contain alpha smooth muscle actin stress fibers. And on the, the x-axis, we have our variety of different sera that we test, uh, treated the cells with. And you can see that there are no significant differences in myofibroblast activation when we treated cells with pre-TAVR sera and post-TAVR sera from the same patient. Now, why might this be? I think that one reason why we didn't see an effect with our sera was because of our use of plastic. So using standard tissue culture plastic, VICs automatically activate to myofibroblasts, as indicated by these alpha smooth lactin stress fibers. And I think that do, that's likely due to the superphysiologic stiffness of tissue culture plastic. So to get around this issue, our lab has developed uh, essentially polyethylene glycol hydrogels, so PEG hydrogels of varied stiffness, so that we can maintain myofibroblast quiescence in hydrogels that might mimic the, the valve extracellular matrix in healthy tissues versus a more diseased fibrotic stiffness 
that might reflect uh, uh, fibrosis in the valve. So we actually saw this when we cultured cells using our soft and stiff hydrogel systems, using a soft matrix that resembled the, st uh, the stiffness of healthy valve tissue. We observed that VICs maintain their myofibroblast quiescence, whereas when we culture cells on stiff hydrogel systems, we observe that cells activate to myofibroblasts. This giving us a really nice tool to be able to control myofibroblast activation and quiescence. So then we performed essentially the same experiment using our soft hydrogels. Since soft hydrogels provide this really nice platform by which we can control myofibroblast activation and keep cells in a quiescent state, we can then probe the effects of biochemical cues. So we essentially performed the same experiment where we treated cells with pre-Tavrosera and post-Tavrosera, and then we observed a significantly different response. We observed cells activate in pre-Tavrosera and maintain their deactivation in post-Tavrosera. When we quantified the data, we observed that cells uh, treated with post-Tavrosera from six of eight patients had significantly re re reduced myofibroblast activation uh, in post tavarsera relative to pre tavarsera from that same patient. This is just another way to look at the data set. So we took the post tavarsera uh, activation values and divided them by the average pre taver value. And this is just to mainly illustrate that our hydrogel is able to show patient specific differences in myofibroblast activation levels. This is something that we would have not been able to achieve with uh, using conventional tissue culture plastic approaches. Now, given that uh, we've been able to show this change in myofibroblast phenotype, we next performed a transcriptomics analysis to further evaluate the genes that are associated with this uh, shift in myofibroblast phenotype. So in collaboration with Sierra Walker, it's a she's a fantastic graduate student in the Anseth and Leinwand lab, we performed a transcriptomics analysis and observed hundreds of differentially regulated genes in VICs treated with pre tavarsera versus post tavarsera and we curated some genes associated with cytoskeletal remodeling, ECM remodeling, and fibrocalcification to further illustrate the shift from pre tavarsera to post tavarsera phenotype. We also performed a pathway enrichment analysis on the RNA-seq data set, and we identified MAPK signaling to be one of our top hit, top rank networks. We also inputted our data into ingenuity pathway analysis we also converged on P38 map casing link as a potential pathway that drives myofibroblast activation in the presence of pre-tavarsera factors. And we also took our proteomic analysis, so we took the 15 factors that we identified as more abundant in pre-tavarsera, and we inputted those factors into ingenuity pathway analysis and found that seven of the 15 proteins are indeed upstream of P38 map case signaling. We then next performed some validations uh, studies of P38 MAPK signaling in the presence of pre taver factors. And using our soft hydrogels as, as tools, we then showed that uh, cells treated with pre tavarsera activate as before. But then when we treat cells with a P38 MAPK inhibitor, we observe significant reductions in myofibroblast activation, suggesting that P38 MAPK signaling is an important driver of myofibroblast activation in pre serum cues. Next, we also observed, uh, we wanted to understand whether or not these post serum factors can drive myofibroblast deactivation. So we next performed this experiment where we took soft and stiff hydrogels and treated them with pre serum for two days, and then essentially either kept these cells and pre serum factors, or swapped the media and treated them with post serum factors to assess their deactivation. And that's exactly what we observed. We observed that cells treated with pre serum on soft and stiff hydrogel systems show increased myofibroblast activation, whereas cells treated with post serum essentially deactivate after being treated with pre factors. And these are the deactivation fold changes for cells treated with a variety of different sera. And you can immediately appreciate that the fold changes in deactivation depend largely on whether or not we use soft hydrogels or stiff hydrogel systems. Now, how can these deactivation uh, values potentially be useful to us? So we thought that maybe the degree of deactivation may correlate to patient measures of disease severity. 
So for example, using patient echocardiography measurements, specifically aortic valve area, we observed that uh, by plotting our, soft, uh, our, our full changes from soft hydrogel systems, we did not observe a significant correlation uh, between our in vitro data and patient data. However, when we used our stiff hydrogel systems and plotted our fold changes from, uh, from stiff hydrogels, we observed a significant correlation with aortic valve area, where smaller aortic valve area indicates greater uh, stenosis. So this provides a really nice platform by which we can start to understand, uh, using in vitro models, how we can start to understand how patients might be responding to a TAPR procedure. And we also observed similar effects in cardiac fibroblasts. So we also determined that cardiac fibroblasts, specifically uh, adult rat ventricular fibroblasts, are mechanical, mechanical responsive. So we also showed that these cells on soft and stiff hydrogels seem to maintain their act, uh, deactivation on soft hydrogels and activate to myofibroblasts on stiff hydrogels in both, serum, in both uh, fetal bovine serum and healthy human serum controls. And by using cardiac fibroblasts, and we also show that these cells deactivate in post-TAVR serum factors relative to pre-TAVR pre treated cells. And I think what's cool about these deactivation data from cardiac fibroblasts is that they also correlate to key patient data. So providing further links to disease context in vivo. So we took our ARVF deactivation data from stiff hydrogels and plotted them against what's known as the STS score. This is a patient morbidity score where a higher, where a higher STS score indicates uh, more severe stenosis. So we observed uh, significant correlations with those data sets. Additionally, our deactivation default changes correlated to uh, measures of left ventricular internal diameter measurements during systole and diastole, uh, where a smaller diameter indicates greater wall thickening and greater disease severity. Uh, we also went uh, and dove into figuring out what are the potential magic factors that might be driving myofibroblast deactivation and post sera. And we specifically looked at IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha. These are two factors secreted by inflammatory macrophages. And we hypothesized that the macrophages that are accumulating at the valve implant site might be potentially involved in, medi in mediating the changes that we observe in, in patient serum samples and in, in, in patient sera after TAVR. So to investigate this hypothesis, we thought that maybe we could treat cells with IL-1 beta or TNF-alpha to drive their deactivation. And we do observe that cells that were essentially treated with pre tavr serum factors maintained their activation states. Whereas when we treated cells with IL-1 beta or TNF-alpha, we observed their uh, deactivation. Thus suggesting that infl inflammation is a potential driver of cardiac remodeling after a TAVR procedure. And we also went through our data sets and observed sex differences in our data that might corroborate clinical observations. So for example, I alluded to you previously that uh, left ventricular remodeling is greater in males relative to females. And interestingly, our ARVF deactivation data might seem to corroborate these clinical observations, once again suggesting that our in vitro models might provide links to sex-specific disease contacts and TAVR outcomes in vivo. So to wrap up my talk, um, I really do think that our tools might be useful to enable precision medicine um, and or sex-specific medicine. So my future lab uh, will continue isolating and characterizing serum from aortic valve stenosis patients. And we can essentially generate these patient-specific myofibroblasts on our hydrogel substrates and then start to test potentially different drug combinations to deactivate cells in the presence of patient-specific or sex-specific serum cues. Now, as James mentioned before, now I will be starting in, uh, next year I'll be starting my lab at UC San Diego and in the bioengineering department. And I really just wanted to kind of share some of the ideas that I had and uh, on how I will start my future laboratory. So my lab will really start to use what I'm trying to term as precision biomaterials as tools to start to dissect the mechanisms that might underlie sexual dimorphisms and cardiovascular disease. 
As we know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in both men and women, yet our mechanistic knowledge of the sex-specific mechanisms that guide cardiovascular disease progression, particularly in women, remain poorly characterized. So my future lab in precision biomaterials will uh, operate at multiple different length scales to understand how hormones, sex chromosomes, uh, serum cues, and the inflama inflammatory responses might all contribute to sexual dimorphisms and cardiovascular disease. Uh, one of my first projects will be to characterize the sex-specific biological mechanisms contributing to heart valve disease and understand how sex hormones and sex chromosomes might drive sexually dimorphic uh, cellular phenotypes. I also seek, as I previously mentioned, to optimize patient-specific drug combinations to potentially treat heart valve disease in, in patients uniquely based on sex, age, or race. And thinking at third, uh, my, one of my third projects is to potentially engineer sex-specific implants to improve cardiac tissue remodeling after a heart attack, for example. Uh, we know that men and women experience different levels of infl inflammation after disease or injury. Therefore, I seek to potentially develop sex-specific implants that might modulate the immune response in a best and beneficial way for both men and women. So some takeaway points from my talk. Um, human sera and hydrogels may serve as a useful tool for generating clinically relevant in vitro disease models. Sex differences were observed in cells cultured and sex match serum samples. So uh, please consider sex separating your cells and trying to understand how uh, cells might be, uh, how male and female cells might be responding differently in your systems. And biomaterials can also be used to enable precision medicine. Now, before I end my talk, I also wanted to leave you with some steps that I have taken and steps that you can take today to uh, support the Black Lives Matter movement. So first, we must put in the work to be anti-racist. Um, I started by downloading the audiobook, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. And there are tons of resources on how to, on, on how to be anti-racist. And I thought that this book is a really fantastic start. Um, I've been really enjoying the audiobook uh, on my commute to lab. Um, second, we must face the fact that academia and higher education is systemically racist. If you're on Twitter, I suggest following uh, Black in the Ivory uh, and listen to our Black colleagues and sh uh, listen to their experiences in, in academia. And uh, remember, the first step is really to listen to their stories and try to understand what their experiences are and how we could potentially change uh, academia for the better. And third, learn about how your science could uh, one day impact underrepresented communities. I spent the past uh, couple weeks really learning about how uh, there are race disparities and how heart valve disease is treated in America. And it's just a really fascinating area. And I think that we can learn a lot from our Black colleagues, uh, especially during these really difficult times. Um, but with that, um, I'd like to uh, end my talk and uh, abundantly thank the Anseth Lab for providing this really fabulous environment for me to uh, craft my own research niche. Um, as I mentioned before, I will be moving to San Diego in July of 2021, and I'm currently looking for graduate students and postdocs. So if you're interested in any of the proposed uh, projects that I've kind of outlined and pitched for you today, uh, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. And um, I realize I'm a little bit over time, so I think I'll just end there and uh, I'll try to take some questions that uh, James uh, will kind of outline for me. So uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and I really appreciate your time today. And uh, yeah, I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much, Brian. So wonderful, wonderful science and a very important social message there at the end. So we have got some time for some questions. Uh, so the first one is from Claire, who said, amazing talk, Brian. Did you have any challenges uh, read different species? So giving uh, porcine uh, versus uh, human serum. So, uh, yeah, uh, giving porcine human serum. Yeah, so, uh, so thanks, Claire, for the question. Um, and this is a question I get uh, a lot. Um, it's thinking about... Um, what kind of species should we be using? So, I mean, we use porcine aortic valve, so we use porcine VIX as a routine procedure to uh, do these aortic valve stenosis models. 
I do think that by using human VIX, we might be able to achieve more relevant, physiologically relevant uh, in vitro model systems. But what's interesting is that by giving porcine VIX human sera, we've already observed correlations with how these cellular phenotypes might correlate to uh, patient outcomes in vivo. So it really gets you to think of like what kind of cells do you really need to observe uh, what we are ultimately trying to achieve is an in vitro model that can capture uh, disease context in vivo, right? So I think that porcine VIX might serve as a kind of just a baseline, but I would be more than open to exploring how human VIX might uh, respond to human serum cues as well. Okay, okay. so um, Anne says, fantastic talk, Brian. Will you consider menopause hormonal changes in older women as you continue studies? That's a really great question. So um, yes, so this is something that I'm very interested in. And we've been obtaining our serum samples from elderly patients. So presumably patients that have already gone through menopause. Now, uh, obviously that decreases estrogen levels and estrogen is a known cardioprotectant uh, for a variety of different cardiac fibrosis. So as estrogen levels drop over time, we really need to start to understand how the dynamics of estrogen might influence uh, valve disease. And something that I wanted to try to talk to, to you today about, but just did not have enough time for, is that aortic valve stenosis is a sexually dimorphic disease, where men tend to develop a more calcified-like phenotype in valvular tissue, whereas women develop a more fibrotic scar-like phenotype in valvular tissue. So how can we start to understand how sex hormones play a role in this process is something that my future lab will certainly explore. Okay, so um, we've got one more technical question. Um, so uh, this is from Casper, uh, who says, uh, they've got a question regarding the PEG models. So did the VIX grow on these hydrogels as a monolay or did they infiltrate the PEG? Mm, that's a good question. So we did culture these cells in a two-dimensional, so I, people use the term 2.5D, I suppose. So we cultured the hydro, uh, we cultured the cells directly on the hydrogel surface. Um, there's some work in my lab. So there's a, there's a graduate student that's very interested in culturing VIX in three dimensions. And we observe differential uh, effects based on dimensionality. Um, so I think an interesting question would be, can we potentially use 3D models as a more accurate uh, mimic of valvular tissue and potentially treat these cells with serum factors and observe whether or not 2D, 2D versus 3D cultured cells might lead to more uh, physiologically relevant models of this disease? Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely ways you could build on the complexity of this model. Um, but... Um... Yeah, I just think we'll wrap it up there. We've had a lot of comments coming in saying thank you very much uh, for using your platform to speak out on racial disparities in research and academia. I right. just want to finish with one question from uh, Alexandra, who's our speaker next week. Um, oh, okay. Could you share any thoughts on how biomedical scientists um, are suited for helping to combat health disparities? So any advice on those who might uh, want to get into this area? Sure. I mean, I think that based on what I've tried to do in the past few days is just to try to understand whether or not, um, start with your own research, right? Start to say, okay, how, do, how can my research potentially impact uh, uh, underrepresented communities? And we're, I think, I feel like the, all the diseases or most of the diseases that we focus on as biomedical engineers uh, really, um, really might play a role in, uh, it, it, they're essentially, I'll just say it, they're white diseases. And what we need to try to understand is how these diseases manifest in community, communities of color and really try to say, okay, there are going to be differences between uh, white and, uh, and underrepresented communities. So I think that one way that biomedical scientists can start to engage is start talking to our Black and Latinx colleagues, right? Start to understand what are the disparities that exist and how can bioengineers could potentially influence uh, these disparities. So that's kind of what I was trying to get at with the research that I've been looking into is um, male, so Black and white patients are essentially treated very differently 
in, uh, in valve disease. And black patients are less likely to be admitted for uh, valve replacement surgeries relative to white patients. So obviously there's social issues there as well, but then thinking about uh, potential technology differences that you can do uh, to, to help the black community in a variety of different ways, I think would be helpful. Thank you. So that was a, a wonderful talk and some uh, wonderful advice, uh, speaking on so many different levels.